Greetings comrades and Gatos, and this is another In A Nutshell video. Today we'll be looking at uh, canonizations in a nutshell, and the reason why is the beatification of Venerable Carlo Acutis is coming up. Sorry if I pronounced the name wrong. So I had to jump on the bandwagon and quickly make this video. So I start off, there are over 10,000 saints in the church that are in uh, mentioning the records. I mean, technically anyone who goes to heaven is a saint, but, but these are ones that have been approved for veneration by the church. So a lot of these saints are martyrs and saints who were around from before the process of canonization had been developed. But this doesn't undermine their sainthood. You see, by the 4th century AD, so as opposed to the martyrs, which people believe that they'll become saints when they died, there were people referred to as confessors. And so instead of being martyred, they basically loved the faith at the end of their days. And they were publicly venerated, like Saint Hilarion the Great, Saint Ephraim the Syrian, and Saint Martin of Tours. These were a proven example of how the public should live. And they were, they were approved by the local bishops in a form of local canonization. They had to be investigated thoroughly to make sure they were genuine role models for the people to follow. This, uh, the martyrs would be investigated heavily as well. Now this did lead to some problems initially. For instance, Saint Tupatus said that in Carthage was a woman called Lucilla, and she was punished for venerating an unapproved or uninvestigated martyr. So these things have to be done properly. You don't just simply take the bones of any dead Christian to start venerating them. No, these things have to be properly investigated. And Saint Cyprian would later say that the claims for martyr were, were, were to be investigated properly to make sure that they actually deserve that title and on it. This would include investigating the faith of the sufferer and the motives that animated them to suffer for their faith. This would be mainly investigated through looking at court records and witnesses being interviewed, the witnesses of the martyrhood and the people who knew them. And St. Augustine of Hippo himself mentioned the procedure for the veneration of the martyr. And he said that it started when the bishop of the diocese would open a special investigation for their veneration. He would send the results of this investigation to the archbishop or metropolitan we would then consult with the suffragan bishops and make a decision about this. This would eventually result in the altar being built over the saint's tomb or the transferring of the relics to a church, and the miracles done by the saint's intercession would play a part in the canonization, although soon to be saint. And the Pope would eventually take control of the final decision in 808 AD. And this started with Pope Saint Leo III confirmed the canonization of Saints Swibert, Swibert, sorry, pronounce that wrong. And then and this will start the process of the veneration occurring of a saint all across the entirety of Christendom by, by 993 AD, being led by Pope John the 15th, who was canonizing Saint Udalric, who was the Bishop of Osberg, Hugh of Boves, or Hugh of Boves, the Archbishop of Rouen, uh, sorry, pronounce that wrong, I can't pronounce these, these, these European names, canonizing Gualtia, who was the last non papal canonization in 1153. Now, the current method for canonization was established in 1983 by Pope St. John Paul II. The first step was the Servant of God, or Servus Dei, and the people who were in this stage were called Servants of God. So the bishop, which was usually the diocese of the candidate that they were buried in or they lived in, would open an investigation into the, into the course of the canonization. This would usually start around five years after the person died. And this would involve extensive research of a candidate's actions and their works and their sermons if they were a priest and it would involve a lot of interviews. When all this information was collected, the bishop would send a report to the congregation for the causes of the saints, and a postulator would be assigned to investigate the cause further. Some religious orders who produce a lot of saints, they have their, they usually have their own postulator. It's pretty much just been carried out throughout the generations. So, the postulator would then collect more information about the servant of God. They would exhume the body at some point, uh, to examine it, to see if it was incorruptible. I mean, they used to have just the sheer incorruptibility of the body as a sign of a, of a canonization, but, but that's no longer the case. They use more than just that. Another reason why they exhume the body is to make sure that they can preserve the relics and to make sure that no one's uh, starting some form of heretical worship or veneration occurring around them. Because the last thing you want to do is start venerating someone who isn't in heaven, because that, that's not, that shouldn't happen. The next step is when the servant of God is declared venerable, or, or venerabilis, and they're called venerable, so venerable saint's name. So when the research is finished, the congregation recommends the case of the Pope, that says that the servant of God has exercised to a heroic degree the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, and the cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. They don't have a feast day at this point in time, or a church open over this tomb or parish is named after them, because you can't be sure that they're in heaven yet. But the circulation of prayer cards and other materials is approved to see if people, when they ask for the intercession of the saint, if a miracle occurs. The first stage is when the individual is known as blessed, and they call called the blessed or 
Beatus or Beata. For the Marte involves a declaration of a genuine voluntary martyrhood as a witness of the faith or for a heroic act of charity. For a non martyr, or they're, all, they're usually referred to as confessors, as they have confessed to their faith throughout their lives in all the actions that they lived and all that they said. And a miracle needs to occur to show that they are in God's beatific vision and that they can interceding for others. This is almost always a miracle of infirmity because in such cases it's easy to discern whether or not a patient has been healed through miraculous means or anything at all through natural means. So for instance, if a patient who had an incurable disease was cured after he asked it for the intercession directly of the venerable individual, and then the cure was instant, complete, and enduring, and there's no other natural reason found for this, then it's said to count as a miracle. And this miracle allows the, the beatification of that individual to occur. The so feast day is made, but it's only in the home diocese of that individual where they lived, or, or in the area where they resided for a religious order, if they lived in one. But they don't have a parish named after them or anything yet. And the final stage, the sainthood, and here they're referred to as saint, or sanctus or sancta. This, to be canonized as a saint, they need at least two miracles confirmed in their name. Though some confessors can only need one, or the Pope may use the actions in that individual's life to help with that process. For instance, Pope St. John XXIII, his actions were to invoke care of the Second Vatican Council. This is when the Church is certain that the blessed individual is in heaven, in God's beatific vision. The saint is a refulgence of the holiness of God, himself through the God's gift. So a feast day is declared, so it's not necessarily an obligatory mass or added to the Roman calendar because there's 10,000 10, saints on the calendar would be quite a bit excessive. Pedro parishes may be named after them and there's free veneration of the saint and their relic. So whilst this may not necessarily rely on divine revelation, it's an infallible doctrine of the church because it's related to revelation by his, the historical necessity for it. There is another form of canonization which is known as equivalent canonization. And it doesn't involve such a long process, because this process can take a while. Like, the canonization of St. Thomas Aquinas took over 300 years to pass from one stage to the other, so usually it could take quite a long time for this stage. So the rules as determined by Pope Benedict XIV is that one, there must be an existence of an ancient veneration of the individual. Two, there is a general constant attestation of the miracles and virtues or the martyrdom by that individual by credible historians. And three, there is an uninterrupted history of the person as a miracle worker. For instance, and this occurred in the cases of St. Bede the Venerable from you know, my East Days and Pagan video, St. John of Damascus and Pope St. Gregory the Seventh. In the context of Venerable Carlo Acutis, he was born in 1991 and he devoted himself as a child to the Mother of God and recited frequent rosary as a sign of his devotion. Now, after he received communion when he was seven, he did everything he could to receive communion on a frequent basis and he made an effort to before or after mass to reflect in front of the tabernacle. And he would go for confession once a week. And he used the saints Francis of Assisi, Dominic Savio, Tarsusius, Bernadette Suabiros, and then the, the Saint Pe Francisco and, and, and Jacinto and Marto. Although at that point in time they were blessed and not saints. And he used all these saints as role models in his time. He also supported his friends whose parents were divorcing. He invited them to the home and made sure that they were okay and talked to them. He also defended the rights of the disabled and stood up for those who were disabled and would be bullied in his school. He traveled a lot, but he mostly loved going to Assisi. However, he was unfortunately diagnosed with leukemia, but he offered his pain for Pope Benedict XVI and the church. Now, he wanted to go on a pilgrimage to where all the Eucharistic miracles had occurred. Unfortunately, due to his failing health, that was not possible. Instead, he decided to make use of his love for computers and make a website to catalogue all of the Eucharistic miracles starting when he was 11 years old. I've been on that website and it's certainly something, it really is. People who knew him could testify that he loved to edit comics and films as a form of evangelization. Eventually he died in 2006 at the age of 15 and according to his wishes he was buried in Assisi. In 2013, the Lombard Ep Episcopal Conference approved the petition for his canonization. So Cardinal Angelo Scola led the process and concluded it in 2016 as part of the first stage. So, and so Venerable Carlo was declared a servant of God in 2013 and would eventually be declared Venerable in 2018 by Pope Francis. And the miracle for the cause of his beatification occurred in 2013 actually by a boy who was suffering from a rare pancreatic disease and was miraculously cured. And so this beatification is set to occur on the 10th of October uh, 2020. So in a, in a few days really, less than a week, which is why I'm going to be trying to make this video work, <laughs> because I'm going to try and edit this video very quickly to release it before then. Now, given the speed of this, it's possible that I may be fortunate enough in my lifetime to witness the full canonization of venerable, soon-to-be-blessed 
Carlo Acutis. I mean, how many people can say that, right? I mean, uh, this is something. I was, I was alive throughout this entire the entire time because I had been undergoing this process of canonization, and I've seen I've seen what he's done. I've seen some of the things he said, and this guy is definitely worthy of his titles. I can tell you that. I mean, unfortunately, with the coronavirus thing, I'm not sure if I'd be ever be able to go to like Rome or something you know, to celebrate his canonization. I'll probably celebrate something here. But the Venerable Carlo genuinely deserves his canonization. As I said before, this part of the process requires you need to exercise fully and heroically all the theological virtues and cardinal virtues. People who do that sort of stuff, they are brilliant role models for all of us to follow as members of the church. So just as how he was inspired by saints himself, he should therefore be an inspiration to all of us to follow suit. Hopefully, there will be people throughout history that will continue to inspire. The sainthood, it's not impossible, and it's a call for everyone to follow. It's not impossible for anyone to get to achieve it. It requires a lot of work, a lot of dedication, and your life to be filled with love and everything else required for this process. And Venerable Carlo here truly deserves that honor. You know, I would love to be a saint myself. I've got a long way to go. Uh, but you know, I guarantee you on this earth that there is, a, there is at least one person on this earth right now who is living their life in a way that will let them be a saint at some point in the future. That person is truly following Christ with all their heart, soul, and mind. And they're an inspiration to all of us. So these are after suffering from going too long. I'd like to congratulate uh, Venerable Carlo Acutis for his beatification. Hope he is in the sin here. So if you to be the first to call him uh, by Blessed Carlo Acutis, and you will all be watching this in the future. Hope you will be inspired by his example. I mean, I'll, I'm going to do my best to follow, to follow his suit. He used social media quite a bit as a form of evangelization. And me at this channel, obviously, there's a lot of... I've got... Okay, especially if you look at some of the early content I made, I've got a lot of progress to, to go from being who I was then to being a person who's truly been inspired by him. However, it's not impossible for me to achieve that. I just need to genuinely work towards that. It's a long process to truly change from who I was to who I... from to someone like him. But it's not impossible, and I want to use my YouTube channel as a form of, in a sense, evangelization as much as I can to hopefully help others out there, because he's, he's inspired a lot of people, and I hope that I too can inspire others like him. So, congratulations, blessed Carlo Acutis. Hope you will be inspired by his example, and be inspiration for future saints out there. That's it for this in a nutshell video. If you liked this video, please go like, please share my videos, please comment your thinking of me as a video to do. Please subscribe to my channel so you can see more content, please ring the bell to keep up there with my theology videos. Next episode, find something else to do. Hopefully all of you out there are inspired to be saints, and enjoy celebrating the beatification of blessed Carlo Cortis. Otherwise, that's it for now, so see you next video comments. Until then.